Ο επόμενος ομιλητής είναι ο κύριος Darren Robinson και το θέμα το οποίο θα μιλήσει είναι Building and Urban Physics. Ο κύριος Robinson είναι καθηγητής στο ε, Πανεπιστήμιο του Νότιχαμ και έχει διατελέσει ε, στο παρελθόν σε διάφορες θέσεις ενεργειακού αντικειμένου όπως την Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne ε, και στο Cambridge University. Επίσης έχει εργαστεί ε, σε διάφορο, ως ειδικό σύμβουλος ε, στην, ε, σε διάφορες μελητικές εταιρείες όπως την BDSP. Ε, ο, ε, ο κύριος ε, Robinson θα αρχίσει τώρα την ομιλία του όπως ανέφερα και πριν με το θέμα Building and Urban Physics. Mr. Robinson is... Uh, Thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, I have to apologize um, on three fronts. Um, first of all, I'm English, um, and I'm going to talk to you in English. Secondly, um, I'm not going to bore you with much physics, so I'm going to try and be practical and, and useful. And, um, and thirdly, I've got a lot to say, and I'm interested in what I'm saying, and when I'm really interested in what I'm saying, as you can hear, I tend to speak quite quickly. Um, so, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> okay, so um, I am uh, working at university now, but for a few years I did work, thank you, as a, as a consultant in, um, as in a consultancy, obviously. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you about um, is based on my experiences as both an academic and as a, as a former um, consultant. I'd like to start with some kind of basic principles, very, very briefly, um, just to remind you, because I think most of you probably know these principles already, um, and in any case, most of it's common sense. Um, and then I'd like to demonstrate the application of these principles through some real um, urban design examples. Um, and then I'd like to tell you something about the kinds of decision support tool that help you make your own urban projects, if you're involved in them, um, as sustainable as possible, because every project is unique, and yes, you can, you can take some principles and try to apply them to your own specific projects, but to do that in an efficient and hopefully reasonably optimal way, um, you do need decision support tools. So I'd like to say a few words about the kinds of tools that are available to you um, in, your own, in your own work. So um, the way I think about some, well, what I would call sustainable master planning or sustainable urban design is kind of encapsulated in this diagram that I call the, the onion diagram. Um, so when I'm approaching a, an urban design project, I'm starting really at the, this outer layer of the onion. Okay, so I'm starting with an analysis of climate. So I try to get climate data from my site of interest. I analyze that data to identify where my opportunities are. Um, for example, for evaporative cooling or for using ground source heat pumps or for um, pre-cooling, natural ventilation air, using the, using the ground and, and so on. Then I look at the site and I identify the relationship between my site and the buildings surrounding that site to identify where the potential pitfalls are in terms of other buildings um, exerting a, a negative influence on my buildings due to, due to shading. Then I look at the, um, the building form and the, the orientation of my building. So I'm trying to lay out my buildings um, with respect to one another to maximize the utilization of useful um, solar energy and daylight. I'm trying to um, come up with a form of buildings which maximizes um, access to, to the facade. So I'm able to use natural ventilation, daylight, solar energy, and so on. Okay. And as part of that, then of course I need to design my facade um, so that it is able to well balance the potential gains um, of solar energy, daylight and so on, but minimize the, the, the losses during periods when those resources are not available or when they don't um, compensate uh, or when um, they're not more than compensated for by the gains. And then of course we're looking at the materials um, and going into now the design of our technical systems, so whether or not we need mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, and if we do, well, um, what are we going to use as our source of heat or source of cooling if necessary? And then of course we're designing our uh, control algorithms. And I suppose um, the, the amount of effort that you expend in urban design terms um, is proportional to the 
um, the radius of these circles. So you put a lot of effort in your um, big strategic decisions in this kind of urban design project and uh, relatively little and probably none at all um, when it comes to building controls. It's only when you're actually designing the buildings themselves that you've laid out and you've got the right proportions, um, you've come up with a, a concept for the facade design that um, you would then do that. So golden rules, I guess, are demand minimization, um, meeting demand for services efficiently, reusing waste resources um, if possible, so looking for potential synergetic exchanges between buildings or between complementary processes within a building, and then meeting your outstanding resources in the most renewable way possible. So in slightly more concrete terms, um, we want to arrive at a, at a building form, as I said earlier, which uh, maximizes the um, proportion of the footprint which has access to the facade. So, um, well, I used to be involved uh, in the design and development of a tool called the LT method at Cambridge, and we tried to um, come up with forms that would maximize this um, passive fraction. So that, as I said, that's the proportion of the whole uh, um, footprint which um, is in what we call a passive zone. So that's about twice floor to ceiling height from the facade. Okay. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we want to, for a given um, orientation, for a um, given type of building, we want to optimize our glazing ratio. So here you can see there are different curves uh, where we've got glazing ratio on the x-axis and um, specific energy use in megawatt-hours per meter squared on the y. And for different types of use, so cooling um, is increasing with glazing ratio for this particular location, for that particular orientation. And heating is, uh, is reducing, lighting clearly is reducing rather significantly, and the, um, the aggregate of those um, lends us, tends us towards an optimum at around 30% for this particular context if we're using cooling as well as heating and lighting. We of course want to conserve our resources, so we want to insulate well our building envelopes, and we, we heard earlier about the energy standard, so that's one approach. But uh, for me, it's a little bit um, dogmatic. It's imposing mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. That can be useful, but there are alternative methods available to us, and I'll explain one a little bit later. As I said, we want to um, satisfy our, our resource demands in the most efficient way possible, so we want to use efficient lighting. Um, we want to use efficient heating systems, so possibly condensing gas boilers or using some form of um, district cogeneration. We want to apply these principles systematically throughout, so not just with respect to water, but also, for example, with respect to, sorry, not just with respect to energy, but also with respect to water. As I mentioned, we want to look at for potential synergies, so maybe we can derive energy from waste. We can combust our, um, our uh, incinerable waste, and uh, we can digest our human waste to produce a methane, which we can then combust. And I'll give you an example of that a little bit later. And as I, and as I said, the last kind of element in this, in this kind of process is to um, use renewables. So some examples. I, I was lucky a few years ago to have been given some money to basically just go on a tour of Europe with my backpack and visit some um, communities which were known for being relatively sustainable. And I had a chance to go to a place called Ekoviki in Finland, which is just on the outskirts of Helsinki, um, and to visit um, uh, a quartier called Bo01, which is on the outskirts of the city of Malmö in Sweden, to visit um, Hammarby Sjöstad, which is on the outskirts of Stockholm in Sweden, to visit uh, Vauban at Freiburg in Germany, and of course, well, being British, I had to go to Bedzet um, in, in England. I would encourage you to look at, um, to find out a little bit about these different um, projects. I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I'm just going to focus on Hammerby and Bedzet because they, they, uh, there are particular elements that I think are really give us interesting lessons. So in, uh, in Hammerby, this is really the layout. It's, as I said, it's, um, it's uh, on the outskirts of the city of Stockholm. It's a, a kind of a regenerated industrial area um, where they, the objectives were to really minimize transport demands, minimize the energy used due to transport, minimize the demand for um, energy um, used in the buildings, 
um, and to um, yeah to meet those energy demands in the most um, efficient way possible. With the, well, um, this is uh, well that was the the master plan. This is how how the site looks. So now we've got a we've got a main road that goes through the the development. This has a tramway in the centre, which also goes round here and connects with this part of the development. There are also regular ferries that uh, embark, disembark here and take you across to the, to the mainland into the city. There's a good cycle network. It's actually well thought out with respect to transport. With, compared to some other um, relatively sustainable urban developments that I visited, this is a development that actually welcomes and embraces the car, which is unlike some others. So um, there, there are car parking spaces available to all um, apartments, but there isn't one space per department, uh, per apartment. It's about 0.6 spaces. So they're trying to really impose a reduction in the, in the use of private vehicles. There is car sharing for those that wish to use a car, but not to own a car. Um, and there are, as I mentioned, excellent facilities for cycling to get into the city. Um, there are trams and ferry links. Here's an example of uh, one of the car sharing. So um, this is obviously a hybrid uh, car, which can be plugged in to, um, to this point, recharge for, for free. And I mentioned that they, they try to embrace the car. They have a real normal city streetscape. Um, if you have the opportunity to go to Malmö, which is, a, I suppose, a sister development also in Sweden, you will see that the car is really, um, well, the development is rather hostile to the car. It's really pedestrian only, and that leads to a very different, let's say, vibrance within the, within the, um, within the neighborhood. They also have rather serene areas away from that main, main road. So they've created a, a canal. Um, and this is actually really, really pleasant in the, in the summer months. Um, there is this rather busy road. The, the, the main kind of development, if you like, is fronted with a rather tall block. Um, but on the other side of that block, there are these, so they've created these rather large courtyards. And this courtyard is rather protected by that, front, by that wall that's fronting the main road. And it's, again, rather, um, a rather pleasant environment within that courtyard. But one of the, the real strengths, if you like, with, uh, with Hammerby is not its um, layout of buildings to reduce energy demand, it's not the design of those buildings, um, but it's this thing that they call the Hammerby model. It's the, the application of principles of industrial ecology to reduce the demand for resources. So here in Hammerby, for example, organic waste and um, biosolids from wastewater treatment plant are used to fertilize as fertilizers for the production of um, biomass. This biomass or this biofuel is combusted in a, in a, um, a combined uh, heat and power station, also in, a, in just a, um, um, a thermal power station a little bit further away. This clearly supplies the district heating needs and electrical, well, it's part of the electrical needs of this uh, district. This also provides district heating and cooling. I mentioned that wastewater um, is digested, so um, we've got the production of methane, a biogas which is used by, by some of the uh, buses that service that district. It's also um, supplied into the apartments um, within the apartment blocks. So, um, well, our own waste, if you like, is used to produce a gas which we're using to feed ourselves, kind of closing the, closing the circle. Um, and what else? So um, uh, the purified wastewater is relatively warm. Um, energy is recovered or heat is recu recovered from that to preheat the uh, return water from the district heating network. That then is relatively cooled and supplied to the sea. Surface water is also treated before being um, eventually passed uh, to the sea. There is effective um, waste separation and, uh, and treatment for uh, non-organic waste. So they have this um, system of... Um, of uh, ducts that are, that are buried. Um, uh, we've got these outlets at um, particular points within the, within the district um, where each chute corresponds to a particular type of waste and, and then there is a central system which regulates valves and the aspiration to suck essentially the waste into a central collection point and at uh, weekly intervals a truck comes along and, and sucks up that waste. 
Um, this is actually a rel relatively effective way um, of getting people into recycling, and it seems to have worked. Energetically, does it make sense? I think the jury's out, um, but it certainly seems to be a, a very popular system uh, in that particular um, um, district. Likewise in Malmo. But I said that the buildings haven't necessarily been well laid out for the utilization of solar energy. Um, so here, this is the result of a simulation um, with the Monte Carlo ray tracing program called Radiance, where every single pixel corresponds to how much solar energy is received throughout the, the heating season. So this is um, October to March. Um, so during the heating season in that particular latitude, in that location. So you can see that there's this main kind of um, south facing wall that I showed you earlier. So there, every, anything red or yellow is pretty good. So they're um, receiving lots of um, solar energy. This is of course displacing your demand for applied energy for heating. But you can also see that the majority of, uh, of buildings are um, oriented on the um, north-south axis. So they've got eastern and western facades and receiving very little um, at that relatively high latitude. So it's not particularly effective. Um, now I'd like to say a few words about um, BEDZ, being British, I kind of have to. Um, so BEDZ, maybe some of you have, uh, have heard of that. Um, it's a development um, uh, on the outskirts of London. The objectives were to use entirely non-fossil fuels to um, satisfy the energy demands, to reduce transport energy use by about a half and massively reduce heating energy use to 10% of uh, what we conventionally need. Also to reduce uh, water use and to increase recycling. What they also wanted is to, um, and actually a criticism that we could level at all of those um, five um, exemplar projects is that there is very weak um, social um, mix. So we tend to see that in these so-called uh, demonstration projects, we've got relatively wealthy, young, well-educated families um, that, are, that actually can afford to pay the um, additional rents. What we don't see is so much integration of people that are on a lower income. So they wanted to resolve this here by having a model in which people can own their own apartment, in which they can own half of that apartment, or in which they can rent their apartment or other house. Um, so that was their plan. Initially, the idea was that there would be these three um, kind of terraces of house. So they wanted a compact form in which there's a relatively small heat loss surface area, but also facing south so that they're able to utilize um, solar energy to minimize the demand for, for heating. And then they thought, okay, well, actually, don't we want to also integrate um, workplaces into this development and hopefully have people that are going to be living there also working there so, that, so we're reducing the demand for transport. Um, and they were looking at the layout of these blocks, looking at um, um, the utilization of solar energy, and they, could, they made sure that they were um, spaced sufficiently distant from one another, that this wasn't um, leading to a reduction in available solar energy to the block behind. But they thought that there's this zone that's essentially going unutilized. So decided to put um, workspaces, offices, in that relatively shaded zone. In those offices, the internal heat gains would be relatively high because of the equipment, so they'd need less um, solar energy. They also wanted to have north-facing light anyway, so they reduced the risk of glare um, on things like VDU screens. So then we've got a development now which is actually very high density. And this is, uh, this is how it looks in section. So here you've got your, um, your living space, and here you've got your, your workspace with this uh, roof light providing daylighting to the spaces. And here you've got your, your street and access from one side to another where there's a roof garden. And this is, um, this is how it looks as built. You'll notice these um, Teletubby style, uh, style chimneys. Um, this is actually... So in the Minergy talk, we heard about mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. This is a natural solution. Okay, so you've got two, um, basically, holes. Uh, we've got a, um, a wind vane, essentially, here, which is making sure that the, the outlet is always um, located on the leeward side of the, uh, the approaching wind. Okay, so we've got a negative pressure here, and we've got a positive pressure on this inlet. All right, and we've got a, we've got a heat recovery uh, a heat exchanger here, okay? So heat is being recovered from the outgoing air um, to the incoming. So this is a natural solution to heat recovery. 
With respect to the um, the um, the form and the, the spacing between buildings, this is again one of these uh, wintertime irradiation um, plots. And we can see that this building has been sculpted um, so that um, it's relatively it accommodates a relatively large built volume, but doesn't reduce access to solar radiation to the block behind. So that's actually a very efficient um, solution. But of course, it's it's a rather simple problem, right? It's just a, a repeated set of units. In terms of uh, the sort of thermal design concept, if you like, so it's a super insulated envelope where the U values are typically 1, 0.1 watts per meter squared Kelvin. We've got triple glazed uh, sun space, a further double glazed layer here. The idea is that um, we'd have a relatively warm sun space, which is preheating the ventilation air that's applied to the to these units, in addition to the recovery of heat um, from the um, from those uh, wind cowls. Um, it's a relatively thermally massive interior, so, um, so that excess solar energy is being absorbed within the structure, which can be discharged when it's cooler later in the day, um, so during periods of um, high um, solar irradiance in the wintertime. And of course, this reduces the risk of overheating in the summertime. And here's an image of the interior onto the sun space. Unfortunately, um, what they didn't know when they, when they came up with this design is that um, normally in the UK, sadly, um, when we do have sun spaces, they tend to be used as an extension to the property. Um, so those doors pretty much will always be, be open. Um, and this will essentially be then a heated sun space when there's no um, solar energy, well, when the when the sun is obscured by cloud, as is and sadly often the case in England. Um, so it's not quite as uh, effective as uh, one would have hoped. It probably actually um, tends to increase the, the total heat demand. But it was a <laughs> nice idea in principle. Um, they thought more holistically um, about uh, the reduction of the, the use of energy. So they also thought about the specification of materials of low embodied energy content and also the specification of recycled, recycled materials where possible. So here's an example where they analyzed and they did this systematically throughout the, throughout the project. But here's an example where they analyzed the embodied energy content or eco points of different um, facade uh, um, finishes. So they looked at local oak weatherboard, they looked at um, a softwood um, that was been preserved um, the alternative being a brick cladding, and compared that with a, well, it's very ugly, um, but a, but a P UPVC cladding. And they found, of course, that the, uh, that the timber solution was the, was the best, and that's been used for, for part of the um, facade cladding. They also um, specified a, a kind of green roof, so um, sedum is integrated into the, into the roofs. Um, this is a, a type of vegetation that doesn't really require deliberate irrigation, but does nevertheless um, add additional insulation in winter and reduce the, well, the risk of overheating, let's say, in, in, in the summer. Now, I mentioned earlier that we also need to take care with the specification of our internal appliances, both light and electrical appliances. Or, you know. So they specified systematically um, A-rated appliances throughout um, these homes. Um, of course, they reduce the um, energy um, for fans, for the mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. There is no mechanical ventilation. And um, these units are really relatively well daylit, so reducing the demand for lighting. And what they found is that, um, that these, these investments, these, the additional costs associated with these measures, has a payback period of around 10 years due to the energy savings um, that, uh, that result from them. The result is that um, these homes use about three quarters of the electrical energy for lighting and appliances of a typical home in the UK. Um, but they also thought about the um, supplying uh, electrical energy or harnessing um, solar energy, which is converted into electrical energy with these solar cells that are integrated into the sun spaces, so into the roofs and into the south facing facades. With respect to heating, so using some relatively renewable resource for, for heating, then, um, okay, I better hurry up. <laughs> then the, they specified a, a system of um, using wood chips, gasifying these wood chips to produce a wood gas, which should then be combusted in a, in a combined heat and power engine. Um, 
Unfortunately, the, um, the supplier of that system went bankrupt at about the same time that the system broke down, and uh, this was unfortunately replaced. Um, I think I better, better swiftly move on, but just to say that the energy use is about half for heating as it is in a, in a, a conventional building that satisfies our building regulations. So some um, conclusions from these kinds of uh, case study are that community participation is really key when you want to um, integrate novel ideas into an urban development to get the kind of acceptance and to build the seeds for a tight community. I mentioned that um, communities should be socially inclusive and this is something that's often forgotten. Um, one thing that's important is that um, if you're um, wanting to launch a new urban design project and you want to have competing architects or urban designers um, come up with proposals, that you have very clear competition criteria relating to sustainability with which to judge um, those different competing proposals. And of course that you have some means for evaluating the performance of those submissions. Um, up until very recently we haven't had any kind of modelling tool to enable us to do that, but now we do. Of course, it's important that we have good guidelines or performance criteria for the layout of our buildings, and again, we now have the modelling tools to enable us to do that. I mentioned that I'm not in favour of dogmatic um, regulations. I am in favour of having very ambitious energy performance targets and giving architects, engineers, urban designers um, complete freedom to say, OK, well, here's, a, here's my target, and I'm, I'm going to get there however I want to get there, not how you tell me to get there. Um, that really um, creates an environment for innovation, which is, I think, very positive. Um, and that's why we had these innovative solutions at BEDZ. We also need to think about overheating risk. Now, if we start applying standards like Minergy, like um, Passive House, to climates like Greece, there is definitely a risk that, um, that we will encounter serious problems of overheating in summer months, and that needs to be thought about. And we also need criteria with which to judge that risk. I mentioned about appliances and energy supply, um, and relating to that, we, um, down here, need to be careful when we're specifying new technologies that we're not going completely into the unknown because there are risks associated with equipment failures. Another thing that's really important is that we um, systematically monitor the performance of our buildings and urban developments so that we get the feedback, but also that we have a basis for continued improvement to the performance of those, of those projects. Now I'm going to quickly say a few words in my last two minutes <laughs> about decision support. So there are some pretty pictures uh, that I showed you earlier where every pixel corresponds to how much solar energy is available. There's a very easy um, to use module that I developed some years ago with a colleague called um, Gen Cumulative Sky, which you can use in conjunction with a tool called Radiance to produce those images. Um, so one simulation will produce you um, a, a plot like this where every pixel corresponds to how much energy has been received throughout the entire year. I won't go into the physical basis of this. There's also um, a colleague of mine at MIT has uh, launched a tool called Diva for Rhino, which utilizes that module. Um, and it's a plug-in to, well, to a 3D modeler, Rhino. So you can come up with, you can build your 3D model, use that plug-in, and very, very quickly and easily produce plots like this and actually do many other useful things. I'm going to skip this and say a few words about a tool called CitySim, um, which will be released at some point uh, in the not too distant future, that um, provides us with a rational basis or uh, an efficient basis for modeling the, um, the energy performance of urban developments. Okay, so CitySim basically follows these five stages. You create or import your 3D model. So you can use SketchUp, Rhino, whatever you want to import your 3D model. We then need to attribute that 3D model in terms of the composition of the envelope of our buildings. We need to describe our, the way in which our occupants are using that building, the kinds of appliances that are embedded, um, and which kinds of renewable energy conversion system may have been embedded into the facades, into the buildings, or into um, district energy centers. We need to define a relationship between those district energy centers and our buildings. But we can do this, and we can simulate the energy performance of um, tens, hundreds, thousands, even entire cities in principle. Um, and I won't um, go through this because I don't really have time. Well, I, actually, I've got one minute, haven't I? <laughs> so um, CitySim sends a, a scene description to a solver in which, that, um, in which we um, call a pre-process to an interesting radiation model. That radiation model calculates how much solar energy is instant on every surface of our scene 
accounting for obstructions to the sun, to the sky, and reflections from those obstructions. We then call a simple dynamic thermal model which produce, well, which predicts the um, demand for heating and cooling of every building or every zone of every building. Um, we then call a family of behavioral models where we um, model the stochastic um, um, behavior in terms of the, um, the presence of our occupants, the use of windows, use of shading devices, use of lights, use of electrical appliances. So we actually have a relatively rigorous basis for accounting for the, um, the randomness in people's behavior. We then call a family of HVAC models and a family of energy conversion system models and... Oh, shut up. <laughs> um, if you want to know more about that, then um, have a look at this book. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Darren. Darren, thank you very much for your interest presentations. Uh, questions, questions will follow now for for five to six minutes. Uh, ερωτήσεις ε, σε όποιους θέλουν ε, για ένα διάστημα 5-6 λεπτών, διότι ακολουθεί αμέσως ο επόμενος ομιλητής. Ε, καλό θα είναι οι ερωτήσεις να γίνουν στα αγγλικά για ε, λόγο συντομίας. Ερώτηση. Ναι, κύριε. Κύριε Φώτη. Το μισό λεπτό, το μισό λεπτό. I would like to know more about the CTSIM program. I thought it would be very interesting to use it in my own business. And I I want to ask you how can have it. Download, pay. What, what is uh, the procedure? Okay. Um, at the moment, um, there there is no procedure, um, and my new institution in England is currently negotiating with my old institution in Switzerland to figure out how we're going to take things forward. But it won't be too long before we've resolved this. You think uh, citizen is uh, a social uh, wealth in order to uh, maintain the cost of energy in every uh, facility lower? You should uh, think that uh, uh, such programs, like the Americans do, should uh, be shared uh, throughout uh, the yeah. engineers. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Never mind. <laughs> Oh, well. Hello. As uh, we uh, we saw in the bedset, the problem with the open doors. Um, I suppose that this is a common problem when we when we design uh, something that is radical or new. Uh, for you, what, what is the solution when you design for uh, something uh, for people that you don't know exactly how they're go uh, how they're going to behave? Uh, do you think that there maybe should be a manual when you get in a new building or um, maybe that we should uh, encourage them uh, some way to use it? Yeah. Okay, oh, that's actually a very good and important question. Um, and your questions were very good and important too, I just didn't understand it. <laughs> um, so my, my feeling is that we need to make our design simple and intuitive enough so that they're understandable by people without any explanation. That is very difficult to achieve. Um, in some cases, there's no avoiding a certain degree of complexity. And in that case, yes, we do need to have really simple, you know, one or two page cartoon type explanations um, to, for people. Um, we also need to make sure, well, we can also brief our uh, occupants when we've finished a, a building and one or, or development. And one example of that is, um, is this development at Hammerby Seerstad. So any new tenant or any new owner of a building um, visits a, a, the visitor center and um, they're briefed on the, the Hammerby concept, how to live there in the most sustainable way and what the opportunities are for them to reduce their, um, their carbon footprint. And actually, they seem to really enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, 
Hi. Um, do you think it's easier to build a new city uh, in terms of using all the new technologies, etc., etc., instead of working on an old city that needs much more effort to do some changes and take into account, for example, urban canyoning and things like that? Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Um, the realistic answer is, well, I suppose it depends on where we are. I mean, if we're looking at um, Asia or South America, yeah, where new towns and cities are being conceived uh, on a very frequent basis, then there are wonderful opportunities there, and we can use these computational tools to, to help us optimize those, um, those developments. Um, and we have a different type of challenge in, in Europe, for sure. We're already um, at around 80% urban. Um, and so our challenge is to, is to renovate the existing stock. These kinds of decision support tools we can, of course, use to do that. Um, but I think we're at a very embryonic stage in understanding what's the, the most effective way for, do that, for doing that. And also what kinds of financial um, strat well, stimulus we can put in place to encourage rates of renovation. So it needs to, we need to encourage kind of bottom-up action. Um, and, and that's non-trivial. I, I was very pleased to see the the solution that's being put in place in Switzerland to use a carbon tax to subsidise um, uh, in re investments in renovation. Um, not sure that that's valid or applicable Europe-wide, but yeah. Δεν υπάρχει ελεύθερος. Ευχαριστούμε για πάλι τον κύριο Δάρε. Thank you very much, Δάρε.